Welcome to this old pew. This is the second episode of a special four-part series. Those of us who hang out in this pew have offered to take over the preaching duties at our church for four weeks so that our pastor can focus on some other duties that have been put on hold since the pandemic excitement. This week, we get to hear Chuck Schmidt talk with us about true wealth. We hope you enjoy this message. All right, here goes nothing. Which microphone you mean, Steve? Okay, there we go. I'm kind of like Butch. I probably don't need a microphone. A few weeks ago, when our men's group were discussing this idea of preaching, giving Jamie some time to take care of herself, I was all for it. But let's face it, 2020 was a year we'd like to forget. The pandemic, the Dre Show. And I'm pretty sure they don't teach in seminary how to deal with a pandemic. I mean, but, you know, we did it. And when we thought about when we were talking about it, I figured I would do the children's message like normal, and the guys would preach because they've been to school for play ministry. I haven't. Well, when they decided that I'd be good standing up here, a few thoughts went through my head. First one was pure terror. Second one was, holy crap, these guys think a lot of me for wanting me to do this. And then another thought came to my mind. I read Father Richard Rohr on a daily basis. And he mentioned that true about true wealth. And he's also mentioned how our wealth comes from be known how to see God. Well, the more I thought about it is I saw what true wealth is years ago. My uncle slash grandpa Bill had a stroke. He was here at St. Luke's in, during rehab. I would go down there a couple times a week, play cards with him, spend time with him, help him out with his rehab. And one time in particular, I went there and he wasn't supposed to be having candy. And <laughs> I caught him, and he comes sneaking up on his wheel, on his walker and goes, shows a piece of candy in my mouth and goes, you didn't see a thing. People wonder why I'm a smart aleck than I am now. But I thought nothing of it. You know, I lived in Marion. It's a five-minute drive. You know, it was fun. Well, lo and behold, when he passed away from the complication there, he told everybody, and with his cat, me in the cattle industry, he was known nationwide. That, and the night of his visitation, I'm standing there, and these people are coming up to me. Are you Chucky? Because no matter how old I was, I see a little Chucky. And it's when I say yes, well, you're the one who played cards with Bill. You know, he it meant so much to him that I did that, and it made me realize, whoa, there's something there special that I did without even thinking about it. And then in 2016, when my dad passed away, his boss showed up to funeral visitation, which to me was normal, but small town Iowa, everybody shows up there. Well, he brought a couple of these other guys who I'd seen once or twice before in my life. Turned out these guys were from the corporate office in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They drove all the way from the Twin Cities down to little Washington, Iowa, for the funeral for a retired employee. Now, I mean, I'm not maybe the best with geography and everything, but I'm thinking that's about five to six hour drive for a retired employee. That said something about my dad. And in the meantime, all these people are coming up to me saying, did your dad ever tell, us, tell you the story when he did this for us or this group, that group, whatever? I had no idea half the stuff my dad had done for these people. Because he did it in such a way that it didn't, it wasn't flashy, it wasn't, he did it behind the scenes. And afterwards, his brother, one brother came up to me and goes, you know, goes, I might have money wealth, but he goes, God, I'd love to have the wealth your dad had. Because they were overwhelmed that so many people genuinely, genuinely cared about my dad. And I realized I've got the same thing. Because in 2016, when my wife died, 
at the visitation, I had former I had customers coming up who had never met her before, but they were coming to make sure I was okay. That said something pretty strong and powerful about how about what kind of person I am. You know, it gave me a sense of I hit the Powerball jackpot. You know, and you stop and think about that. You know, and then that Sunday one, thanks to Butch and a few other people, I had the courage to walk in here. I saw I was walking into something very similar. Because when the, we merged the two congregations, I'd asked to be, I'd been asked to be on the con, the committee for to help the transition. And I remember thinking, you know, this will be how do I explain this? Well, we put this, I put it in simple terms. We need to make sure that anybody come over from Trinity felt as we'd known them for years. That first Sunday, I was blown away. I walk in here and you couldn't tell who'd been from Trinity, who'd been from St. James. It was like everybody had known each other for their, all their lives. And I've been to churches where they've done like interdenominal services and Sections are roped off in the sanctuary where if you're from this church, you had to sit here, yada, yada, yada. Not here. This church is something special. And the more I got to thinking about it, anytime I remember all the times, there'd be a new kid in the congregation. All the kids would go walking up to him like they'd known him for years. Or when a kid would get fidgety, as I call it, or rambunctious, have ants in their pants, whatever you want to call it. And they start running around the sanctuary. I don't know how many times I've seen Jamie have to stop her message and let the parent get, nobody cares. You know, it's more of, okay, as long as the kid's not getting hurt, nobody seems to bother him. That is a special kind of thing to be. I mean, this church has a wealth that the big, fancy churches don't have. And you take this last year. When we were adapting on the fly as we went, you know, okay, we can't have in-person worship. Well, what do we do? Well, next thing you know, one person steps up, says, we can do this. Okay, we made it work. We got through it. I've always been told that there are two times a year ministers never allowed to be sick, Christmas and Easter. Well, lo and behold, Christmas comes around, Jamie gets sick with COVID. Most churches have been devastated. Here, we're like, okay, you take care of yourself. We got this. And if I don't, if I say so myself, it, we put on a pretty darn good Christmas Eve service. I would love to see what would happen if we'd been live. I think it would have been really cool. But we had that power to show Jamie, we got this. You take care of yourself. You need to do what you need to do to be healthy. Last Sunday, when Betty and I were both out sick, two members of the worship team being out, some churches would be totally lost. Here, everybody's like, we got this. You know, somebody else stepped up. You know, money can't buy that. Money can't buy that wealth, that versatility, that... I don't know if maybe family is the right word, but it's the closest thing that comes to my mind. You know, we're... We step up here and we gather together, we circle the right wagons, and we support each other. And I don't know how many times, like when I was in the hospital last fall, people in this church were calling me or sending me cards to make sure I was okay. And the same token, I mean, somebody's sick, like, has surgery. At least one or two people call and check on them, if not more. A few times when a stranger's walked in the door here, if at least three or four people greet them and say welcome. It's not, who are you? It's, Welcome, join us. You know, it's, I hear 
all the wealthy people talking about, like Jeff Bezos, he's going to outer space. Whoop de deal. He thinks he's going to see what heaven looks like going to outer space. Me, all I got to do is see heaven every Sunday when I sit at Ellis Park and watch the animals. I don't need to go to outer space to see heaven. Or when Chris plays his music, he's in heaven. I can tell by listening to him play. You know, so money just doesn't, like the saying goes, money can't make you happy. And another saying, love is all you need. Well, unfortunately, love isn't all you need because we need money to survive. I mean, I would love to be able to live on love alone, but love wouldn't pay the electric bill, the mortgage, gas, and everything else. But it's a good way of thinking of it. And when the Dre show hit, I saw more acts of love than I could count. In my neighborhood alone, after the day after the storm, everybody was out with chainsaws, stuff like that, going around helping the neighbors out. You know, boarding up windows. You know, I personally took my four-wheeler around the neighborhood for a little bit, and people were having trouble cutting the trees down. Well, I used my four-wheeler to pull the trees so it wouldn't fall and hit their house and damage it worse. A simple act for a total stranger. I don't know half the people I did it for. But it was that simple gesture. I mean, that is a wealth. That is something that, that we have. I, and yet we also celebrate the good times. We take time to celebrate when somebody reaches a milestone anniversary or a birthday or something like that. You have time to celebrate. And it's a community. So... As we think about more and more, as we go forward, and we get what we thought we were closer to be having the grand opening, we, a snag came in the way. Things aren't going the way we thought they were. What happens? Everybody steps up and says, no problem. We'll adjust. You know, I mean, some religions I've seen, they can't adjust. It is every Sunday you preach ABC every Sunday, and if a monkey wrench gets thrown in there, they are totally out of whack. Here, if a monkey wrench doesn't get thrown into things, we think there's something wrong. You know, but it's the way it is. But we adapt. We show each other how much we care. We have what Richard Rohr calls true wealth. And that is something special. And, you know, I don't know another way to describe it. It is something very, very special here. So as we move forward, let's take time to be thankful for the wealth that God gives us. Like I said on the 4th of July, that picture gives us the ultimate freedom. Jesus gave us the ultimate freedom. You know, our yes, our men and women in uniform give us the freedom to be gathered here today and stuff like that. But that's the ultimate freedom. That's the ultimate wealth right there. When we can go to God and say, help. Or we just talk to God. You know, he gives us the wealth to do this. So in, to wrap things up, I'm gonna, I'd like to say a quick prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the wealth you've given us. We know that it is only through you and your grace that we are this wealthy. And we know that through your grace, we will continue to be wealthy. In your name we pray, amen.